Ludwig Mies van der Rohe has been called one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. In the 1950s and 1960s, he was arguably the most influential architect in the world. He designed buildings that reshaped cities and changed the idea of space. He enjoyed two successful careers, one in Germany, the other in the United States. As a modernist, he revolutionized the American city skyline with his signature steel and glass box international style structures. Now, for the first time ever, the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art have coordinated complimentary exhibitions celebrating Mises' work. Here is a look at the two exhibitions. Here, Mies also constructed the now famous German pavilion. Seldom in the history of architecture has a structure been so influential. Interpretations of the pavilion are as varied as the reflections on its surfaces. However, its function was to serve as a symbolic ceremonial space. Through its expanses of plate glass, Mies allowed the ceremonies within to be clearly visible a concrete expression of the democratic aspirations of the young Weimar Republic. At the opening ceremony, a government commissioner said, we wished here to show what we can do, what we are, and how we feel today. We do not want anything but clarity, simplicity, honesty. Joining me now is Barry Bergdahl, co-organizer of Mies in Berlin at the Museum of Modern Art. Phyllis Lambert, the director of the Canadian Center for Architecture. She organized Mies in America. The Whitney and Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic for the New Yorker magazine. I am pleased to have them here at this time. This is what Paul Goldberger said at the beginning of his piece about Mies. In 1954, when Phyllis Lambert, an aspiring architect and the daughter of Samuel Bronfman, the head of Sigmund, was asked by her father to decide who should design his new headquarters on Park Avenue. She considered every big name from Frank Lloyd Wright to Courbet to Louis Kahn. She chose Mies van der Rohe because she wrote, the younger men, the second generation, are talking in terms of Mies or denying him. 43 years after the bronze and glass Seagram building was finished and 32 years after his death, they still can't stop talking about him. Having said that, let me just talk about him a little bit more before we talk about these two wonderful exhibits and how they became coordinated. What is it about him? I think that there is this internal sense of his own being and f that convinced at 19 years old, 20 years old, one of the top philosophers in, in, in Germany to build in Berlin, to build a house by him. And that that radiates throughout his buildings. There is a, Mies was a person who was an autodidact. He learnt to read philosophy, uh, science, and uh, he had an extraordinary eye. And it was, he, he was not interested in architecture as such. He was interested as part of the epoch. And so it is this over, over uh, overwhelming sort of sense of wh what, what the society is, what what the moment is, and uh, rather than any particularity, I mean, like Le Corbusier is uh, working on the the, the uh, connection between man, uh, well, uh, inches and, and right. feet and, ma and, ma and mathematical, uh, uh, and and uh, rough record is growing out of the ground. But Mises is worrying: what is the essence of our time? And so I think it's this sense of a 
a metaphysical sense of the world that was within him that, that makes the, the extraordinary quality of his buildings. Most people believe the Seagram building was is one of the great buildings of our time, and secondly, the best thing he ever did. Do you believe that? I don't think it's the best thing he ever did, but I think it certainly is the great I mean, He did, because you can't, I think it's hard to pick out one building. I mean, the most extraordinary building I think he did was the uh, Farnsworth House. Right. Because that was such a leap from what he'd been working on at IIT, these steel and brick and glass buildings. And he was learning how to put steel together. He was working at the same time with his students to do clear span structures, that is a huge space without any columns intervening. And he was able to put these together in this tre tremendous leap. And from there on, he developed the clear span buildings. And at the same yeah. time, he was building that. He built the 860 Lakeshore Drive, which was sort of a, it was a very important building, but it was a step in the way of what he, he was working on. He was an evolutionary architect. Things moved forward. And I think it's wonderful in, in the exhibition, in, in the uh, in the images that you show that you took from the very beginning to the very end, mm -hmm. the Barcelona Pavilion, well, yeah. the beginning of his great, great work, and the new National Gallery, because that shows, I think, that tremendous transition that he'd made. Let me just bring Paul in on this, because he wrote that. And, and but, but most people seem to say that you should see this in the almost chronologically if you go to both of these exhibitions. Do you agree with that or not? It's certainly stronger if you see it chronologically because you discover that the, there, there's a myth that Mies is perfection, absolute, complete, rational perfection. In fact, it was struggle and angst, just like yeah. any other art, great artist is full of struggle and angst. And, and both of these shows show us really connected to the culture, not disconnected from it. And he brought in a lot of influences, but they were distilled through that extraordinary metaphysical sense that Phyllis was talking yeah. about into this thing that I think more than any other architect, he created the image of what modern is. What modern is both in the popular sense, people's, you know, the, the layman's right. image right. of modern, right. 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 but also in the highest and most profound critical and art historical sense of what modern was trying to do. Well, how would you characterize that? I think it was a sense of lightness, thinness, freedom from a sort of heaviness and a sense of, of sort of bulk and mass and weight and also freedom from the most traditional forms of decoration. And reduction to the purest. Reduction to purism, exactly. Right. Although he was not always as absolutely and completely pure as <laughs> he or his followers <laughs> like to pretend, of course. That's one of the great things that these shows also show us, is yeah. how, in fact, Mies could decorate with the best of them. He just did it in his way. These two exhibitions, uh, you hope the, what do you hope they accomplish? Well, I think you've set it up here in a certain way, is how do you, how do you take on something that, uh, within three minutes, we all agree, represents yeah. the essence of the modern, the 20th century, and look at it uh, afresh, so we hope that it would be possible yeah. to think again about and with Mies. And so the the uh, to have taken the, con the almost contrarian point of view and say let's deny the less is more and do two exhibitions, right, which right, has right, right, led to all sorts of commentary. <laughs> inevitably, in those two uh, catalogs, yeah, seem yeah, to right, really run right. in the face of it. But it was, in a sense, to say could we conduct an experiment, cut Mies in two, and say these two thirty-year careers taken apart will allow us to open up the questions all again. Okay, but, but then let me ask both of you as curators who put these two together, what new comes out of this, both in terms of the combination of this, what new understanding about him, what's fresh about it? I think everything from his development, which what, what as Paul said, one sees him as someone who's struggling, who's connecting. We tend to the sort of postmodern Mies that we've had up till now, not that these two exhibitions, right. I think, to, don't bring us a new postmodern Mies, has been a reductivist Mies that has taken almost all of the cliches out there readily available and kind of uh, accentuated them. Uh, so to discover a Mies who's reaching out uh, to connect with the avant-garde, to connect with the most diverse uh, kinds of experiments about self-consciousness about space, uh, a whole range of types of, of, of building types, just to bring in even unexpected buildings that he was involved with, uh, unexpected contexts, one begins to uh, see a mind in formation and a much more uh, diverse production that doesn't allow you to settle into uh, yeah. 
uh, into the three or four cliché images. And I, and I think when one gets to the three or four cliché images, uh, they're seen with the, the sort of materials that these other uh, mm -hmm. perspectives bring to them, so that the Barcelona Pavilion can be looked at anew, maybe. In yeah, but I think that uh, you're, you're, because you did a, a terribly important essay in, in, the, in the exhibition, and that is Mies and the Landscape, uh, and the landscape. Mies has always been seen as somebody who's completely unrelated to the context that he was working in right. and to the environments. And this, I think that's one of the th things that this show, these two shows, brings out. Oh, absolutely. Uh, your show, too, very much. Yes, so absolutely. Really, okay. There's a very good essay in the America catalog about Mies and, and urban context, yes, too, yes. which is really okay. the equivalent, in a way, of Paris. But, but come back to your point. Let me just elaborate on that in terms of landscape and, and, and his own thinking about that. Well, I think, you know, Mies always said, and it's, it's true, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing is special. I, the buildings I build, are an idea, and they're not. Uh, they don't. Uh, they're not tailored to each situation, which is absolutely true. But at the same time, can you imagine Seagram in Chicago? And can you imagine the, C the Chicago Federal Center? This very powerful, black, serious, in in New York City. You see, so so that these buildings, there is a relationship to the context in which these buildings are. In the way he yeah, always yeah. Rills, yeah. brings his buildings into the city on a platform. He establishes that I learned from your show. Yeah. At the real house. I mean, this is extraordinary. Yes. You know, I thought that Did, he was this the first house in Germany. Yes, the house yeah. of philosophy. Yes. And, then, and then, of course, at IIT with that marvelous, marvelous flying carpet yeah. sort of image of the of the campus. That, but this is where he learned to insert the building into the city, which he called a jungle. You know, that went on and on. But and, and you had to find uh, how you could make a marvelous place in that city. Yeah. And this is what he's doing. So he's not doing what Le Corbusier did, was tabula rasa. Right knocking everything down, or he is actually making di discrete uh, um, places in the city that are open and yet they are part of the city at the same time. You could you can put these uh, all over the city, you could put them in different cities, and there's a kind of a sense of, of uh, connection between them, and this is what is uh, extraordinary. You know, the, the, there was a time, I think, when, when Mies was really the enemy, in the the enemy, of the enemy of the avant-garde in architecture. Right. Uh, in the late 70s and the 80s in particular, in the age of postmodernism, when everyone was talking about going back to history, we were so turned off by all of the wretched buildings that were imitations right. of Mies. Yeah. You know, not Mies's own work, like the Seagram building, but the garbage on Third Avenue that was a right. knockoff of Mies, that it led to a reaction against all things modern. Right. And then, in those years, nobody really looked carefully at Mies because he was seen as the sort of progenitor of all this horrible stuff, even though, in fact, his own work was very different. Now we've but, come but far enough, people, I think, so we can look back at the original did stuff Did the postmodernists make that distinction or not? They, they, they tended not to, or occasionally they would, just for the record. They'd say, oh, of course, we know he's a great architect, but look at all this terrible stuff, and it's really important that we do different kinds of buildings now. But in the end, and it was a criticism of all of. In the end, it was they were thrown together more than they were put apart. And the notion that that a modern building, a Miesian building in particular, is like this glass. It's just a right. pure object dropped down there, right. as opposed to something that really relates to things and creates space in between, like the little yeah. space between these books, in yeah. fact, which actually has meaning. The way these books lie on the table is right. almost very Miesian, and you right. can feel some space. Now we can look at that more, we can think about that more, because we've gotten away from the whole postmodern reaction. What's, what, take me, go ahead. I think what's most, one of the most fascinating things of your juxtaposition of the, uh, the real house and the Venturi's mm -hmm. mother's house, which one also thinks is almost uh, identical in date to the Seagram's building, uh, is to think that Vent you know, Venturi is launching uh, that critique right. right at precisely that moment, but your juxtaposition says we should perhaps sort of rethink even about that moment around 1958. Exactly. Uh, they're and brothers under the skin on some level. Exactly. Right. And the other night there was a program at the Museum of Television where they rebroadcast the uh, 1986 film made on Mies, his centennial year, the kind of mm -hmm. the, the veritable moment not to be doing Mies. Yeah. And we were we went there rather dreading it. And one of the most incredible moments was a interview with Robert Venturi in 1986, and he said, the thing I most regret is having uh, launched less is a bore. I think that one has a lot to learn from Mies. Right. And this was in 1986. So having gone there dreading it, we thought of, sort of thought maybe we have been talking to Venturi 14 years ago. Here is the yeah. arch postmodernist, even if uh, cool. denying it now, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. actually yeah. very early, ahead of the, ahead of the curve, uh, wanting to rethink Mies.
interesting the thing about Amis too is I just went to see the Blake exhibition. You, you talked about I did. it there. You're yes, right. I know. Well, there was this complete connection between the two, Blake and, and Mies, because Blake was against rationality, and he, right. and he, you know, Newton, he said, this is too rational, you have to have creativity. And Mies, exactly the same thing. He was not this rational being, you mentioned this, you know, that, 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 that everything was logically, thing. there was always this poetry, this was, there was a naivety in, 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 his, in his work, which was extraordinary, and he was not this ready-made, uh, uh, out of the head of Jupiter, person who was just laying down these buildings. Yeah. And this is what is so extraordinary. He, he talked about Ford. He was fascinated in the 1920s. Everybody was f fascinated by this uh, mass production and these right, things. Right, right. And he said, he said, yes, but it's too mechanistic. He said, we have to have our feet on the ground and our head in the clouds. Yeah. Yeah. But can you define this philosophy? Um, we've talked around it that comes from him. A what philosophy? Of, of, yeah. Did Mies have a philosophy? Did he have he talked really about, I think, and it's, it's, it's the internal thing. He didn't talk about it much. When right. he would describe his buildings, it's always fairly much a description of how they, what, what the pieces are. And what in, the, in the office in Chicago, with all his, I was speaking to Gene Summers, who was his right-hand man for 17 years. And I said, Mies, did, did Mies ever talk about you know, his phil philosophical intent. And he said, no, he was interested in making things clear. He was interested in the structural architecture. Yeah, clarity. So that there was these, these two, yes, absolutely. But there were these I two levels that he was, mm -hmm. he, he was uh, on, you know, and... and uh, mm -hmm. But they had qualities that he never talked about, but he could convey in the work that nobody else could. I mean, there's a serenity to a Mies building that is not present in most sort of imitation Mies buildings. Most but he wouldn't talk buildings. about it. He wouldn't talk about it particularly. He wouldn't talk about the achievement although, although of serenity. Although I think when Phyllis talked mm -hmm. about his dislike of me mechanistic things, he was sort of, that was as far as he could go to say that. It's very interesting that the, the images you showed at the beginning all had figures in them, yeah. which is right, because in fact, people feel right inside a Miesian space. They don't feel that it, that it excludes them the way so many modern spaces do. There's something about the way the human figure is in that space that feels as perfect as the presence of the human figure in any kind of architecture throughout history, mm -hmm. I think. It is as natural and right. But I think there's a, there's a connection there. I think the big, if, if one could say, I want to put my finger on a Miesian philosophy, it is the hard one where he, he takes on this, there's a kind of crisis of confidence in this issue of the technological, but it doesn't lead to a retreat from the technological because he emphatically mm -hmm. says, this, the 20th century, is the moment of a technological transformation of society. It cannot be denied, it cannot be undone, but we need to both struggle with it, transform it, and transcend it. And so there's a kind of, there's a realism in the sense of wanting to deal with what he will over and over call, call, again call the facts of the epic, uh, with this desire towards spirituality, towards uh, a, a sort of restoration of something that might be either lost or in danger, but without nostalgia. That's absolutely And right. I think that yeah. that is one of the reasons why uh, he suddenly seems to be uh, of such now. contemporary relevance. Well, ex in express it again, because I want to make sure I understand. This grappling with the issue of the technological, but yet a seeking for spiritual values and a, a, a sort of acceptance of the facts of the era. Because what he says in that, that uh, comment, and again, as you say, not declared in a lecture, but in his philosophical notebooks to himself, is that we um, agree with the means, but not the end of Ford. So in other words, the steel building is this. We have to accept the rolled steel section, but we don't accept it as something that we don't need to struggle with to try to bring to some reflection about, about some kind of universal, some essential that goes, I think, to what you're talking about, about this putting the empty space that is to be occupied by someone who's going to come and have some kind of experience that's not programmed but's created in a certain way. Let, Let me talk about Go ahead. There's a sense of humanism in all of it, I think. Yeah. Always. An ever-present humanism, although that's not a word Mies himself used. I think it's one we can apply now after the fact. You always sense that these spaces were made for people and for human life and human society to go on within them, which is very different from what happened with a lot of the architecture that uh, followed me. But it's interesting the way he even draws. He never mm -hmm. does these mechanic, mechanical right. views of buildings that are, mm -hmm. that are called isometrics. Yeah. He always draws perspectives from the ground. 
and he asked photographers when they were doing the photographs from the ground. This is where people perceive he was interested in the body and how the body Absolutely. moved through these buildings and how, they, how, how the body perceived the spaces yeah. they were seeing. The other reason it's so relevant now, and this is what Barry was talking about, I think, is that we're now at a mo another kind of revolutionary moment. When Mies developed his work, we were at a moment of tremendous technological development and a sense of things being very new. Now, with computers and cyberspace and a whole mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. technological yeah, revolution, we're it. right mm -hmm. now thinking again about how that will change architecture. And the lesson of Mies, that it will change architecture completely in one sense, but it does not have to change architecture at all in another sense, which is to make a civilized enclosure for human use. Yeah. And to, to be but, able to but, have but both it, of those things is important. I, that, I thought about this question earlier, and I wanted to ask you now. Where are we now in terms of architecture? Let's, let's take ourselves away from Mies, or use Mies as an example. Where are we today? Is there some sense, picking up on what Paul just said, a look at where we are? We, there was some excitement here because of Venturi. He's got an exhibition, you know. And, and, and an exhibition of, of uh, and Frank, Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is, 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 is at the yeah, Guggenheim, yeah, yeah. and here we got two museums uh, devoted to me. Right. Where are we in architecture, and is there some sense of searching? Because, and let me just sort of, you know, you've got a generation. We're beginning, if Mies was a generation, then moving to, he was representative of a new generation coming on, you know, and then you have another generation that came after him. I would assume the oh, yeah, whole sure, sort of yeah. gang of four and all that. But in, and then, where are we well, today? I think that he he himself felt that architecture would change again. There would be when when there was a new kind of technology, mm. and he he said this, and he said then there will be something new. And he was always talking about something alive and something new. So that all this dead yeah. stuff yeah. would something he would just not not not. It's not alive. It's not new. But I would think that the kind of uh, attack that uh, Frank Gehry has on his work is a very much... The kind of attack he receives? No, no, the attack, oh. the way he approaches his work, okay, I don't know right. attack is okay. probably mm -hmm. the wrong word, mm -hmm. but the way he approaches his, his work is using this technology. He does buildings you could not have built before uh, the computer was there. It's because it, not only the design on a computer, but it's actually the fabrication right, of the parts, right, which right, you could right, not have right, done. Right. It, was tried, it was tried in Sydney with the Opera House. It was a tremendous struggle to do that. And so I think that this is sending architecture, I don't know where it's going to go, how it's going to go, but it certainly is, a, is it something new. There's simply no question that it's something new. Mm. And, uh, but the attitudes towards humanism, I think that, uh, that you talked about, uh, that, that uh, of Mises' work, I think people are beginning to understand. I hope that, that, that that's one of the major things that come, comes out of his His attitude towards humanism. Yes. Yeah. Tell me when you met him, what was he like? You know, he was amazing. I had spoken to all sorts of architects, and they always criticized everybody else. And I, 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 <laughs> That's, that hasn't changed. <laughs> and, I, and I asked, there was some question about the Corbusier, and I asked me, you know, what about the Corbusier? Everybody said he couldn't build in New York, because he already had yeah. <laughs> something else. And he said, but of course, he's a wonderful artist. Of course he could build in New York. Yeah. You know, and he was the most generous man, and he was, you, the, the sense that I talked about with real and this 20 year old man yeah. convincing a major philosopher to build his house there was still that sense of his own being and he was also very funny he had a great sense of humor uh, this is seen in drawings that he, yeah. he did and the way he would you know when he had one or two martinis he would do he, he, <laughs> it, it took the edge off his shyness I think he was yeah. an enormous he was shy shy. yes oh yes and of course he also had trouble with the language which he didn't speak any English when he came to America must have been desperate for him, and yet he learned. One of his one of his uh, people who worked with him said, "You know, it took us so long to work something out because he'd say, now how do you say that in English? And how do you say this in English?'" Now, and how old was he when you were, you know? How old was he? Yes, seventy something, seventy. Let's see. Well, I could figure it out. Yeah, but, but in the early seventies, seventy-two. When he came, when you hired him to do the Seagram building. When he yes. Wow. And. Uh, but he was, uh, there was a gentleness about him, and there was nothing didactic about him. There was nothing, he said, do this or that. He always said, well, try again and try again. It was always this kind of uh, a gentleness. There was no uh, harshness. All right, let me take a look at some things we have here. Start with, this is a real house. Take a look at that. Now, at first, I think the exhibition that we uh, did at MoMA is an attempt to in a way give you a context to think about this building 
uh, as one that is denying. There's already this complete uh, stripping way of decoration. I think we look at it at the uh, beginning of the 21st yeah. century as a kind of nostalgic little cottage. Right. Uh, the thing that's amazing when you encounter it in the suburbs of Berlin is that unlike all of its neighbors, it's stripped of all ornament. And Mies has already pulling no, out pardon. a kind of essential order out of that building. But it's not only an order that implies that the, that the building is made up of a rational number of parts and a rational building method, but mm. he opens up and voids the last bay of the building the, uh, where the window is missing all the way over to the right to frame a view of a landscape that's yet to come. Next slide, uh, uh, next is the Bismarck Monument Project. Just reflect on this. Bear? Well, this is... This is, I think, this, this uh, element of Mies that runs right through his life, which is uh, simultaneously an exploration of the new and a kind of basic conservatism that's always uh, almost like a weight, a kind of pull on him. And I suppose, too, as we look back uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, that's one thing that makes him such both a prototypical modern but an untypical modern in this uh, sort of struggling with traditional values. For who would expect that one of the first competitions of a future modernist is to celebrate the unifier, mm -hmm. you know, the militaristic yeah, that, unifier. Yeah, of but Germany. that's not his choice. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think that what no, is so interesting in this is also that sense of repetition that comes mm -hmm. back in the mullions of the yes. of the yeah. uh, right. high and, rise the, and that he's playing with a rhythm that's deliberately too narrow. It's a kind of spacing of rhythm that has almost musically to deal with the scansion of the eye rather than the uh, fundamentally the necessities. Okay, of the next the next one is a Pearl's House again, and one he's well known for. What should we say about this? There's a mm -hmm. sense of sleekness yeah. in all of these, actually, and a sense of, of tight surface pulled, pulled across. Well, that one, when you get close mm -hmm. into it and you see the capitals mm -hmm. on the columns, I mean, he's, but that wonderful yeah, opening, that mm hole, -hmm. oh, I mean, that reduce, is absolutely extraordinary. Reduce the classical detail to yeah. its boiled down to its thinnest essence. But you find that, that opening, that hole, in the, in the Farnsworth house, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and in the Seagram building on the, on, on, on yeah. underneath it. It's almost a puncturing of, sp of a kind of space inside the perfect geometric element that becomes yes. a kind of, uh, almost a viewing place for you to look out. So that that yeah. uh, one violation of the perfect geometry becomes the place that positions you vis-a-vis -vis the exterior of the environment. One could take it all the way up to the lobby at Seagram's. Okay. And certainly draws you in. Yes. It, it, the next one is the, uh, well, this that, is a Corolla Mira. Yeah, that, that was a, the Villa project. Yeah, that was a full-scale mo model. And what I, to me is interesting is that Bees, in, beginning in, in America, drew to think. But then at the, he got to a point where he just made models, and the use of models in his work was just a very, very, very He interesting. drew to think. He drew to think. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, next we'll see, uh, as I started to say, the Werner House. This is Barry. about when, Paul, do you think? Werner House, Barry, do you know the Barry. exact date? 1913. 13. I think, yeah. So just 13, a few years after um, yeah. real. Right. Outside this, Berlin as well. Berlin. This is just in the suburbs yeah. of Berlin. Interestingly, mm -hmm. right next to the Pearl's House, there's the uh, famous story of Mies going to visit the Pearl's House after the mm -hmm. uh, Second World War, one of his few return trips to Germany. And he was taken around to rediscover this, uh, this early villa culture that he had been part of. Yeah. And he acknowledged the Pearl's House. And although over your shoulder is the, the sort of Neo-Biedermeyer uh, Werner <laughs> House, he didn't even turn around. And so one, there was a kind of editing of the career that went on with me, so which is one of the themes of the show, is to, to, to reverse, to that, reverse okay. the yeah. editing. Okay. Yes. But, but he edited himself. He yes. edited himself. Yeah. So that's All one right. of the and denied... And then and Acolytes encouraged even more of that editing, yeah. of course. And, and, the pro and the point of the editing was what? To do what? It was to suggest that this was a pure and perfect, rational yeah. right. architecture. From beginning to that, end. Right, that developed almost like, you know, Athena springing from the head of Zeus. Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I think and then an avant-garde architect... And didn't have any connection to traditional architecture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got you. Next is a glass skyscraper project. This was when, again? 1921. 21. 22. This is 22, I guess. This yeah. Mm. Well, what he's actually looking at here, and he talk, talks about it, is the reflection and the, uh, uh, of, of glass. Uh, he said if you took a big, large pane of glass, it became very boring. And so what he's working on here is how he, he actually had plasticine. He put these long pieces of glass into the plasticine to be able to see what he was doing. And here, of course, you see... A proto, I would say, absolutely proto idea of structure because God knows what that structure is. It's some yeah. sort of a central column with, with cantilevered 
floors uh, on them, which was, simply couldn't exist. But it's an idea. Yeah. It's, and, and so you see a sort of yearning to go, to go towards a um, structural architecture. And he said, you know, buildings, when he showed this one or the other skyscraper, he said, buildings in construction are so absolutely wonderful. This overwhelming. You see the skeleton frame. And then they put, when, when they put the stone all over them, they completely disappear. The power goes. Yeah. And so this is what he's working with. OK, the Weisenhof apartment is next. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's part of a large um, uh, 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 project that he edited. This is his, uh, that he uh, was the uh, designer, not right. designer, the master planner. Uh, master planner, planner, planner. Yes, right. But this is interesting, because you see he's completely covered up the steel. You, you wouldn't know that's a steel building. The only reason you First know it is because the, 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 the verticals are, so, yeah. the, the are so, so, so minimal. Right. The Herman Lang house is next. Well, this is interesting. Of course, this is not the Herman Lange House in a sense because this is one of Thomas Roof's photographs of the Herman Lange House. So this is already a sort of artist responding to, and one feels yeah. it. But he's responding in a way that kind of has resonance with Mies in as much as he's blackened the windows in a certain sense. So that yeah. Mises play with transparency and opacity, although in certain moments you see right through the building as though it weren't there. So that kind of... Uh, uh, solid screen transparency oscillation that Mies was interested yeah. in is something that I think Roof has picked up on and made uh, almost accentuated in these, uh, in these photographs. Okay. The next is a German pavilion. But this is a Thomas Roof picture? Yes. Mm -hmm. Of the new one, then? No, uh, yes, uh, yes, the reconstructed one. Oh, right. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, of course, that has all the elements of the, what w would be happening is the plane of the roof and the plane of the podium. To uh, be this seen is later. Pardon? To be seen later. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, the, the podium was already there in, 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 the, in the real house, but here it is really yeah. so much, uh, so clear. Okay. Well, I think that's what's so fascinating. In the real house, of course, is on a steep hillside, so he needs it in order to create a place for his building. The Barcelona Pavilion is on a flat fairground, but yet his first instinct is to carve out the place where he's going to make his building. Uh, simultaneously to separate it, but then also to reconnect it in that way. So the first instinct is always to almost inscribe the territory uh, for architecture. Yes. Okay, the next are the new National Gallery in Berlin. Well, this is, um, you know, the, his last building, and there are actually two buildings that were put together, a, the uh, 20th Century Gallery at the bottom, which is a permanent exhibition, and the exhibition pavilion at the top, which was to be uh, for temporary exhibitions, and this is exactly how the place works now. Uh, th th it's the idea that he's finally got to his pure space, pure steel, structure and space together. This is only steel and only glass, this building. There is nothing else that intervenes. You see uh, some exhibition uh, pieces that are, are in, in the exhibition now. And it is, when you come up from it, uh, this is at the back of the garden, but when you come up from, you see it on the podium. Here, the podium is very strongly accentuated. And again, that podium, and you mount up to this thing. And although it is going like when one rises to a temple on a hill, it is not a temple on a hill. You, you see the city reflected around you, and you are in the building, and you are, you be able, you're able to walk in a sort of serpentine. Any, any way you want to, there's a freedom. And I think the sense of freedom in Mises' work was extraordinarily important. You mentioned earlier the Florence Worth House. Yes, yes we, indeed. Before we take a look, just give me some sense again of why this is so important in his evolution. It is so important in his evolution because he had, take, he had struggled to find out how you could really put steel together. This is the first expression of a building uh, that is just pure steel and pure glass. And he worked with the space. It's, it's also a building where there are no columns that mm. intervene in the space. The columns are on the outside. And so it is a building in which the space, the continuity of space, and the space that keeps on unfolding on itself when you're in the building, and, this, and the building also in the landscape. The fact that the building, it's, it's on, it, there are two planes, mm. and then the third plane, which is lower, which is how you rise up into the building. It, the importance is that he said himself, he said in 1933, he described the fact that the fact that you could use steel or concrete and plate glass allowed you to do work that you could never do before, that you could have space that you never had before. And he said, we will not give that up. And he said, it also allows you to connect to the landscape. And this building really 
that was a kind of specification for what this building it, is. It was designed for a, as a weekend home? Yes, that's exactly. In, in putting together these two exhibitions at these two museums, how much conversation, how... Yes? Well, we didn't. We were so busy. <laughs> I mean, we knew that we were doing this, but we were so busy trying to understand what we were working with. There was so much work to be done yeah. just looking at the material, analyzing it, yeah. that we never had a chance to speak. No, I think the fact that we... No one wanted we, to pick up the phone and say... We had no room to do it. Yeah, but it was, it was anything about competition here? <laughs> None. None. I think of it no. more as a scientific experiment where we've said, okay, we're, you do Berlin, there's ex this career divides almost exactly in half. 30, three 30. decades in Germany, three decades in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, the archive is enormous. Uh, the issues of making one think about it anew are enormous. We each yeah. take our 30 years, we'll compare results, see you in two and a half years. Uh, let's have the same opening date, and uh, by the way, uh, this is the size of the catalog. As you can see, we agreed, <laughs> at least on the yeah. oh, uh, dimensions, is, yeah, if yeah, not right, the right, thickness. Right, right. Right. Listen, look at this. There you go. Um, and so then we came back together, and the exciting no thing... No conversations in between, no sense of, uh, you won't believe what I just found, or no. what, oh. what conclusions I just no. came to. Not really. Who just, I just talked to. No, nope. just indications that we were still excited by it, and yeah. that the astounding thing was, rather than having complete burnout after such a long project, that the day when the opening came, yeah. we were going to be able to go and visit the other half of the career oh, right, and see what the uh, what the other team had come up with, and also see this extraordinary thing to be involved in someone's biography and decide that you're going to not exactly put blinders on, but that you're going to, in the case of the Berlin show, that you're going to say, I, my biography doesn't need resolution. I'm only going to deal with the portrait of the artist as a young man. What's the difference in the man you knew, just if you could confine yourself to what this was about, and the man you discovered here? What's the difference in the man? I think the difference in, even for the public, as I did when Phyllis invited me to come for an early preview of her exhibition, and I walked into the first gallery, and there was a table filled with books and a, a row of paintings on the wall, and my first thing was to say, Oh, well, we have paintings in our show and books in our show because Mies was becoming an intellectual and yeah. involved with the, uh, the art world also in Berlin. I suppose we didn't put them in the first gallery. And then it struck me immediately as there it was. Here was a man who packed up the essence of a world for himself, brought it to America, and there it was in the first gallery in, in, uh, in the Whitney show. Yeah. And had decided for himself, these are the issues that really are essential for me to deal with now in architecture in a new land, and I'm going to deal with them. And one sees this extraordinary process unroll. And all of the themes are recognizable from Berlin, but the entire context, as well as the very personal aspect of that, that intense search, I think you've captured the view. Uh, okay, but before I go back room. to Phyllis, tell me what themes you're talking about that come out of Berlin. The themes of interest the in new technologies about, and new yeah, structures, right. uh, the building as a, a search for authentic structure, but also as a kind of frame for a relationship to the outside world, yeah. this realist con confrontation with technology that we've talked about, as well as an interest, and this was a surprise, I think, for both of us, a profound interest in nature, both in relationship to landscape, but also mm -hmm. in relationship to natural mm -hmm. science research. That, to me, was the amazing mm -hmm. thing. Was I remember at, at the study center at the CCA, about four years ago, one of the scholars that said to me, what was Mises' relationship to, 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 to the context that he was in? And I said, no. And then I was, I rude that day, <laughs> was, you know? And that's a marvelous way to say it, because it, it became so evident and so strong. And so when I knew about Barry's essay, something about the landscape, that's about all I knew. And when I read his essay, and I saw the show, and I said, oh my god, this is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, you know? it was there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what would you say today? in answer to the question about his relationship to landscape, I mean, other than what you've already said here. Well, of course, it's la a landscape. You, you wouldn't say none, you would say what? I would say that it was, a, it was tremendously, con he was tremendously conscious right. of this. Right. All right, let me take a look at, at some continuations of Mies in America. This is what it's, Lakeshore Drive for anybody well, who's ever been well, to Chicago. This is, a, this is a fascinating image, because right. 8, 860 Lakeshore Drive is on the left, and 900 uh, Lakeshore Drive, 900, uh, um, 910, 910, uh, 910's um, uh, Esplanade, as it's called. Right. But just stop here, because don't, don't go too far away. Because the, you can see how clear the, uh, sk the, the skeleton structure is. I do not believe that that's what Mies really finally wanted. 
it's like the the figure the cover of Gay, which is a, a German magazine, which uh, he had a building that was much more like the one on the right, the dark building in the city, the mysterious building, the interiority of the building. And this is, even though that building is not a great building it, uh, it, in itself, the, the two buildings, this is the building that led to the Seagram building, that he was going to take the skin, not have the skin stuck to the structure, but the skin away from the structure, so that, that you have a much richer yeah. uh, play of light, of, 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 of realizing that there is a structure and there isn't a structure. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mystery to me, which I find is fascinating, that you find in these buildings, you find in the New National Gallery, I mean, that mystery of that space. Mystery of space. Yes. Yeah. Okay, the next one is, again, Lakeshore Building, uh, Lakeshore Drive, 860 Lakeshore Drive. This is an exterior of the lobby. Yes. Mm. Well, this, again, is a, that great pl plaza that, he, that, that joins the two buildings, and the, 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 the way the uh, columns come down to the ground, and then there's this Look, there's a whole huge structure above that, mm -hmm. you know, and th 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 so that there's a kind of a definition of an openness, and then the enclosure of uh, that that is uh, above it is astounding, and you, you see it, it photographs this way. Okay, coming up now is the Seagram Building. Well, on the left is Philip. That's Philip. Philip, and on the right is nice. Nice. All right. Well, there's a, a small photograph in the exhibition of when just after the building was built, in which you see the building set on its plaza. Yeah. And the fact that people always talk about the Seagram building, they do not talk about the Seagram building as being a, a precinct within the city. They don't see the fact that the, the four seasons are the ground level, which is you know, sticking up, what Mies has his hand right on the top of, well, actually it's a part of it, yeah. and uh, that, that at the ground level, that there is a presence of life, a presence of human existence. And after the Seagram building, Seagram building is really two buildings. It's the long mm -hmm. bar building behind mm -hmm. and the tall building in, in front, and then set on this, in this precinct on this podium. And all his buildings afterwards, the, the uh, Federal Center, the Toronto Dominion Center, there was always a, a number of buildings playing against each other, sliding mm -hmm. from a, a sort of a, still the romantic German idea right. coming through. And then there is the, always a pavilion, whether it's a bank pavilion or whether it is a post office, which is a presence of human existence. Paul Wise is a great building. It's a great building for so many reasons. It's a great building because of its extraordinary beauty, perhaps more than anything else. The, the proportions, the materials, the presence in the city. As Phyllis said, it's a presence. It's not just a, it's a place, it's a presence. The plaza, which exists not just to set off the building, although that was part of the reason, but also to be a place unto itself and to connect to other things, the way it right. connects to the racket club across the street and everything else. Right. You know, it's interesting, um, somebody once said critically of Mies that Mies never uses diagonals, which are much more naturally part of human life. We sort of tend to walk in, but in fact, part of his genius was to make us the diagonals, in effect. You know, if you look at the Seagram Plaza, there are no diagonals because we are the diagonal as we yeah, cross right, it. Right. And we feel within that beautiful enclosure that he's made, which is really one of the greatest outdoor rooms that's ever been made in, certainly in the 20th century and, any, and in New York. Um, so it's beautiful for, and great for those and, and other reasons as well. I think. This, the uh, next slide shows you the lobby. And the connection to the racket club mm -hmm. across, right. the, across the street, so you see the how, how, yeah. how beautifully he tied that building into the city around it. it. It's not stepping apart from the city; it really is connecting. It's just not connecting by imitation; it's connecting in a, in a different, much more subtle way. And you know, the magical thing is that when you walk towards the through the open, uh, you, go, you come through the glass through the open uh, lobbies, which you know have you go on to the Four Seasons. And you see reflected in the wall, glass wall of the Four Seasons, you see both the, four, the, the uh, racket and tennis club, and also you see the Picasso curtain, so that you have this yeah. conflation, this sense of this whole cycle of the, of the also, space. Even on a very simple level, it's one of the only buildings in which almost every building built by a real estate developer in New York at that time, turn, the elevators were turned. So you would walk in the lobby and then have to make a 90 degree turn and wait in a kind of dark corridor right, for the exactly. elevator. Me set the elevators, in fact, 
Um, you walk in the front door and there you walk in, and there you are. Right. So while you yeah. wait, you actually look out and see the light that nice. Phyllis described. Also, every last detail of that building was designed specially for it. Philip Johnson, who was Mises' associate on the project, designed the faucets in the bathrooms. Every nothing was taken out of a catalog. Everything was made particularly well, it for it. It was it was an opportunity to do that. Yes, that was right. the thing. It was it was a mm -hmm. new time. You know, there wasn't even you couldn't use drywall at that time. It was really yeah, very interesting. Primitive, a lot of primitive technology. Here is what Philip Johnson said in a recent conversation, Philip at 95, talking about Mies. He did the greatest buildings of his time. I mean, they still, you go back and you earn it all about the skill and the greatness of the designs. What was it about the designs that you thought made them great? I can't make it as clear as I can with a copy of a Roman <laughs> Temple, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> because he made the original buildings, you see, yeah. he didn't need any any figures to help him. See, what was the relationship between the two of them, Phyllis? Well, Philip, when Mies asked him to be the co-architect of the building, Philip said he almost cried, and uh, the relationship was. I don't know, it was a complete, Mies was the most cordial man, and he would never had a difficult relationship with anybody. There was a, a little scene between the two of them that have been t talked about, but that was incidental. It was just, I think, too much, probably, drink. <laughs> and <laughs> It happens. Yes, it happens. But uh, it was completely cordial, but Mies was the architect of that building in every way. And, um, you know, interesting that you talked about the plaza, mm -hmm. because Mies went back to Chicago uh, it's, it's a complicated reason of the AIA and, and professionalism in this country, where they, where, where the professions try to keep AIA the American Institute of Architects, yes, where they try to keep the uh, Germans uh, or foreigners who came into the, the United States uh, out of the professions. I mean, there was a, a and so Mies was not accepted uh, in the AIA in New York uh, to, to have his license for New York because um, they didn't feel that he had an appropriate high school degree, okay? And so Mies <laughs> went back to Chicago. They told him he could take a high school leaving test. Mies went back to Chicago, and Philip then worked on the plaza. And in working on the plaza, he made the whole thing in, in water. He put uh, water over the whole plaza and had just a path going into the building your diagonal. Mm -hmm. Of course, this was impossible for me because the freedom was gone. Right, of course. <laughs> That's a great That's story. That's a wonderful That's story. A wonderful I never heard story. that story. That's yeah. amazing. And it makes the point, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the amazing thing, as you were saying, is that what this, the sequence building puts everything on stage. The plot yes. doesn't only put the building on stage, it, it puts, puts both the city on, on stage, stage and then alternatively those who were in it on stage. So, so there's three this steps up from the, from the, from, from the, um, street, you know, are just amazing. They just mm -hmm. elevate you, putting you on stage. Indeed. Do you, Paul, do you? Philip, mm -hmm. was, Philip Johnson was Mises' greatest acolyte and the person who really did the most to raise his reputation here. Did a show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1947, which helped bring him to international attention as well. But like so many acolytes, he simplified, oversimplified what he was trying to honor. And I think that was really the problem. That was what we saw in what you've just said about the plaza, in fact, that he, um, Philip, for a very long time, supported the view of Mies as this pure, perfect rationalist and didn't pick up or chose to ignore all of the subtle aspects of his character and his architecture and his influences that these two shows have now so brilliantly brought to the forefront. Uh, what, what did Mies think was his greatest achievement? Hmm. Well, I think that for what he thought and what he said, he talked about rational architecture, and, uh, you know, and what he really did, I, I, I think that he, he wanted to do an architecture that everybody else could do, but that's not it either. I don't know what he thought was his greatest achievement, but I think that these, the quality, I think that, you know, each building that he did, that was the best building he ever did. Yeah. When he did Crown Hall, he said that was the best building he'd ever had. And then when he did the new National Gallery in Berlin, <laughs> that actually, he had done a, a, a building in concrete, which was very similar to that, with another museum in steel, very similar to it. And, you know, and, and then he, 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 he didn't build them. They were, they were projects. And then he finally, it was a building he had to build. I think, I think for Mies, 
that the clear span building was the most important. And I think that those clear span buildings have a much greater variety and, uh, and, and possibilities within them than the skyscrapers. The skyscrapers, he went through sort of a few stages. And then he got to where he thought that was right. And from there on in, he had no real interest, I think, in them. Mm. But he kept on through his whole life in America working on the clear span building. And I would think that having Berlin his crowning glory, and I, I think that everything he was working on was towards begin Berlin because it, had, it, it was all the things we've talked about, the building on the podium right. and the, this, the, the structure, uh, uh, but it was the mystery of the building. And it was the, the, the extraordinary space in, in the building. And I think that that was everything he was driving towards. I think it was this, the last word you said. I think it was a creation of a kind of space. And I think one of the problems of the Miesian legacy is it's much easier to focus in on the structure and the thing of the building rather than to understand the mysterious art of making mm. the spaces yes. both within and without uh, and only separating them by a glass pane, either opaque or transparent. And both are dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there are very few people in all of architectural history who have actually created a new architectural language, and Mies was one of them. And to not only create that language, but then to be able to make of it things that are just almost indescribably beautiful and that keep pulling us back to them over and over again, make you want to look at them, go in them, feel the space, feel the texture, and just be made serene and happy by them. That's an extraordinary achievement. My thanks to Paul Goldberg of the New Yorker Magazine, Phyllis Lambert, Director of the Canadian Center for Architecture, organizer of Mies in America, Whitney Museum of American Art. Also, Barry Bergdahl, co-organizer uh, co of Mies in Berlin, Museum of Modern Art. He's also at Columbia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. The and Glass Seagram Building was finished, and 32 years after his death, they still can't stop talking about him. Having said that, let me just talk about him a little bit more before we talk about these two wonderful exhibits and how they became coordinated. What is it about him? I think that there is this internal sense of his own being and f that convinced at 19 years old, 20 years old, one of the top philosophers in, in, in Germany to build in Berlin, to build a house by him. And that, that radiates throughout his buildings. There is a, Mies was a person who was an autodidact. He learnt to read philosophy, uh, science, and uh, he had an extraordinary eye, and it was he, he was not interested in architecture as such. He was interested as part of the epoch. And so it is this over, overwhelming sort of sense of who, what, what the society is, what, what the moment is, and uh, rather than any particularity. I mean, like Le Corbusier is uh, working on the... the, the uh, connection between man, uh, well, uh, inches and, and right. feet and, ma and, ma and mathematical, uh, uh, and, and uh, rough record is growing out of the ground, but Mies is worrying what is the essence of our time. And so I think it's this sense of a, a metaphysical sense of the world that was within him that, that makes the extraordinary quality of his buildings. Most people believe the Seagram building was, is one of the great buildings of our time, and secondly, the best thing. In a lot of influences, but they were distilled through that extraordinary metaphysical sense that Phyllis was talking yeah. about into this thing that I think more than any other architect, he created the image of what modern is. What modern is both in the popular sense, people's, you know, the, the layman's right. image right. of modern, right. 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 but also in the highest and most profound critical and art historical sense of what modern was trying to do. Well, how would you characterize that? I think it was a sense of lightness, thinness, freedom from a sort of heaviness and a sense of, of sort of bulk and mass and weight, and also freedom from the most traditional forms of decoration. And reduction to the purest. Reduction to purism, exactly. Right. Although he was not always as absolutely and completely pure as he or his followers <laughs> like to pretend, of course. That's one of the great things that these shows also show us, is yeah. how, in fact, Mies could decorate with the best of them. He just did it in his way. These two exhibitions, 
uh, you hope the what do you hope they accomplish? Well, I think you've set it up here in a certain way. Is how do you how do you take on something that uh, within three minutes we all agree represents yeah. the essence, the modern, the twentieth century, and look at it uh, afresh? So we hope that it would be possible yeah. to think again about and with Mies. And so the the uh, to have taken the, con the almost contrarian point of view and say, let's deny the less is more and do two exhibitions. Right, which right, has right, right. Led to all sorts of commentary, <laughs> inevitably, in those two uh, catalogs. Yeah, seem yeah. To Joining me now is Barry Bergdahl, co-organizer of Mies in Berlin at the Museum of Modern Art. Phyllis Lambert, the director of the Canadian Center for Architecture. She organized Mies in America at the Whitney. And Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic for the New Yorker magazine. I am pleased to have them here at this time. This is what Paul Goldberger said at the beginning of his piece about Mies. In 1954, when Phyllis Lambert, an aspiring architect and the daughter of Samuel Bronfman, the head of Sigmund, was asked by her father to decide who should design his new headquarters on Park Avenue, she considered every big name from Frank Lloyd Wright to Courbet to Louis Kahn. She chose Mies van der Rohe because she wrote, the younger men, the second generation, are talking in terms of Mies or denying him. Four or three years after the bronze he ever did. Do you believe that? I don't think it's the best thing he ever did, but I think it certainly is the great I mean, He did, because you can't, I think it's hard to pick out one building. The most extraordinary building I think he did was the uh, Farnsworth House. Right. Because that was such a leap from what he'd been working on at IIT, these steel and brick and glass buildings. And he was learning how to put steel together. He was working at the same time with his students to do clear span structures, that is a huge space without any columns intervening. And he was able to put these together in this tre tremendous leap. And from there on, he developed the clear span buildings. And at the same yeah. time, he was building that. He built the 860 Lakeshore Drive, which was sort of a, it was a very important building, but it was a step in the way of what he, he was working on. He was an evolutionary architect. Things moved forward. And I think it's wonderful in, in the exhibition, in, in the uh, in the images that you show that you took from the very beginning to the very end, mm. the Barcelona Pavilion, well, the yeah. beginning of his great, great work, and the new National Gallery, because that shows, I think, that tremendous transition that he'd made. Let me just bring Paul in on this because he wrote that, and, and but but most people seem to say that you should see this in the almost chronologically if you go to both of these exhibitions. Do you agree with that or not? It's certainly stronger if you see it chronologically because you discover that the, the, there's a myth that Mies is perfection, absolute, complete, rational perfection. In fact, it was struggle and angst, just like yeah. any other art, great artist is full of struggle and angst. And, and both of these shows show us really connected to the culture, not disconnected from it. And he brought it. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe has been called one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. In the 1950s and 1960s, he was arguably the most influential architect in the world. He designed buildings that reshaped cities and changed the idea of space. He enjoyed two successful careers, one in Germany, the other in the United States. As a modernist, he revolutionized the American city skyline with his signature steel and glass box international style structures. Now, for the first time ever, the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art have coordinated complimentary exhibitions celebrating Mises' work. Here is a look at the two exhibitions. Here, Mies also constructed 
the now famous German pavilion. Seldom in the history of architecture has a structure been so influential. Interpretations of the pavilion are as varied as the reflections on its surfaces. However, its function was to serve as a symbolic ceremonial space. Through its expanses of plate glass, Mies allowed the ceremonies within to be clearly visible, a concrete expression of the democratic aspirations of the young Weimar Republic. At the opening ceremony, a government commissioner said, we wished here to show what we can do, what we are, and how we feel today. We do not want anything but clarity, simplicity, honesty.